Our next speaker is Michael Neufeld from the Air and Space Museum to talk about APL and the Discovery Program. So while we're waiting for this to come up, I should just say many of you, or at least some of you, know me as Fun Brown V2 Peinemunda. And after 20 years of doing that, I said I have to find something else to do. Uh, I have kind of exhausted that line of attack. And uh, I had uh, begun thinking about several topics and what I've hit upon, at least for, uh, for the moment, uh, was an interest in the entry of the Applied Physics Laboratory, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, which most of you in this room, being an insider audience, know is only 30 miles or 40 miles away, maybe less than that, on the way to Baltimore. Uh, the fact that I was a Johns Hopkins PhD had a minor influence on my interest in the APL. But uh, it was mostly because Bob Farquhar, who couldn't be here today, uh, was in our department and wrote his memoir, uh, well, uh, at least after he was in our department. He was supposed to do it while he was in our department, but that's another story. Bob always does what he wants to do. So what this project actually has moved into is two projects. One is on this origins of the discovery program, and the other is on the origins of the New Horizons mission to Pluto which is an entirely separate topic, uh, which I'll be talking about next year, I guess, when I can come, go back to it. Well, of course, you already had some background here uh, in previous talks, notably uh, Mr. Callahan's talk yesterday with all those uh, budget graphs, and he talked about the lost decade of the 1980s. And today, Arturo Russo mentioned some of the crisis and changes precisely in this narrow window of time that I'm going to talk about today. Um, the, you know, of course, it is almost a, um, a standard narrative in the planetary scientists I've talked to about this topic that there was a moment, that there was a real sense of crisis at the end of the 1980s about this. Of course, so you saw from the graph, from uh, Callahan's graph, the uh, lack of launches until 1989, although I should note that was partly an artifact of the uh, shuttle disaster, and there might have been launches in 86, 87. But uh, at any rate, there was certainly a period of uh, uh, decline or decrease in funding. What I found very interesting was when I phoned up uh, Leonard Fisk, who uh, was the Associate Administrator for Space Science from, I think, 87. I'm not quite sure exactly what year, 87 to 1992. He gave a completely different picture than what the planetary scientists, notably Wes Hunters, who I've talked to, and one of my, char my chief characters, Tom Cremigius of APL, he said this was a great period of expansion. He came in, the budget of NASA started going up as a result of Reagan and then of Bush, uh, first Bush at least in the late 80s and the 90s. Uh, he uh, pointed out that there had been an agreement made between the uh, NASA administrator and the SSB that 20% of the budget would be allocated to space science. This agreement was made in 1984. It was a result of the near death, which was described, the planetary program and the general reduction in the space science program at the beginning of the 80s. And after NASA had survived that, SSB was promised a 20% budget. So NASA's budget was going up. And therefore, the Office of Space Science and Applications, as it then was, that budget was going up uh, 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 very quickly at that time. And there were a number of missions in the queue delayed by the shuttle disaster, which were on the Im imminently going to be launched, notably. Uh, uh, Hubble Space Telescope, Galileo, Magellan, Ulysses, all were going to be launched. And so as far as Len Fisk was concerned, this was not a period of gloom and doom at all. This was a great period. Of course, he was the period coincident with him being AA, but so this, is not, this is a period actually when things were going, started going really well and there was an expansive budget. Certainly, this wasn't the feeling that the planetary science uh, community uh, uh, felt at the time because of the lack of launches, because of the gap. And one of the responses to this was, do we need a small spacecraft program, uh, particularly in view of the failure of the observer line and Mars Observer in particular to live up to its budget requirements? Now, I know that there's a little argument actually about whether the Mars Observer narrative that we usually hear, namely that it was just a program out of control and too expensive, was really the case. I mean, Eric Conway, among others, has noted that part of the big budget increase for Mars Observer was that it had to be delayed an entire uh, 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 Mars launch opportunity from 90 to 92, and that uh, greatly added to its cost. But at any rate, there was certainly a sense then that there was a need for some other 
smaller missions to increase the flight rate, to increase the amount of data coming back, to deal with the problem with these gigantic, expensive flagship missions which were eating up the entire budget. Now, as far as I can tell from the documents that I've been able to so far find, uh, the initiative for a, small, a new small spacecraft program started with Jeff Briggs, who was the Division Director for Planetary Sciences, then called Solar System Exploration, uh, in uh, and that SSED means Solar System Exploration Division, uh, in uh, the spring of 1989. And uh, he actually uh, created a small initiative, uh, it, uh, it, and it was part of the strategic planning that uh, OSSA was making at that time. And Len Fisk uh, told me probably that he thinks he invented the idea of strategic planning at NASA for mission planning. At any rate, uh, there was a strategic planning process going on in OSSA uh, in, that, in 1989. And one of these workshops that was coming up was at the University of New Hampshire in June 1989. And so that this small program initiative was going to be discussed there. But there was a lot of hostility in the community as well, or at least skepticism in the community about a small mission program because the basic uh, message was, well, we tried it with Observer and it was a complete failure, so why should we try another small mission program? We can't control costs. Planetary missions just cost hundreds of millions to billions of dollars, so there's nothing you can really do about that. And, and others have mentioned already this problem of piling on. Everybody says it's the last bus out of town, therefore we all have to get our instruments on it. Well, um, the, the early idea for a small mission was actually converging on the idea of near, near-Earth asteroid rendezvous. We've already heard in a several presentations mentions of the fact that asteroid missions and asteroid rendezvous were constantly under discussion in this period, and there was the more ambitious Comet Rondu asteroid flyby craft mission to be combined with Cassini program at the time. But it would appear that a near Earth asteroid mission, which was uh, relatively low energy and low complexity, might be a good candidate mission for, uh, for a small spacecraft. However, again, there was this hostility or skepticism in the planetary sciences community. And that's where. Uh, uh, first of my, I think, two key actors, well, the other being Wes Huntress, I'll talk about who's here, with his, is Tom Kermegis of APL. Uh, and this is a picture of Tom Kermegis, which is, this is an audience I mostly don't have to introduce him to, but he's a very eminent uh, space plasma physicist, student of Van Allen, had had experiments beginning uh, as a postdoc uh, at, at Iowa, a doctoral student and a postdoc at, on Mariner 4, and had, uh, uh, and I think he's there, I don't, I don't know who these other gentlemen are, somebody in the room might be able to tell me. Uh, I think this is the low energy charged particle experiment. He was the principal investigator for LECP on the Voyager mission. So he had uh, a cons position of considerable influence in the in the area of uh, uh, space physics as a student of Van Allen, as a very uh, uh, successful uh, PI and co-I on many, many experiments uh, to virtually every planet. And he says when, when New Horizons pass Pluto, he will become the only scientist who has had an experiment that has gone to every single planet. I can't verify whether that's true or not, but it's probably true. Um, in, in, uh, at this point in time, uh, Tom Kermegis, or Stomatios, uh, as his Greek name is, was the chief scientist of APL Space Department. And I should say something about APL Space Department here um, uh, for context. Although in this discussion, in my paper, and everybody else has written about APL and JPL and a competition between two institutions, in fact, it's not the competition between JPL and the entire APL, which is always has been a predominantly Navy-funded laboratory, but between Space Department, which was actually only at that time about 10 percent of APL's uh, complement of around 3,000 people, uh, it, the Space Department had built its uh, reputation and history on the transit program for the Navy 
and then had uh, uh, had been involved heavily with SDIO missions in the 1980s. At the, and, and as we transition into this period, is actually uh, looking essentially for a new, uh, uh, would, would be transitioning again under the leadership of Cremegis, who became head of Space Department at the beginning of 1991, to having more NASA missions. So it had done significant numbers of heliophysics type or Earth orbital spacecraft missions. Uh, at, the, at the New Hampshire conference in, in June 1989, uh, Cremegis talked, uh, Cremegis intervened in one of the discussions about what kind of low-cost program could there be, and his intervention was, you guys are looking at the wrong model. It's not Mars Observer, it's the Explorer program. Explorer should be the model for what a small spacecraft line should be, not only in its constant level of funding, but also in a small spacecraft as constrained cost and a science focus. And he was challenged to present something to demonstrate how that could even be possible. And he was, uh, he had called his secretary, had her fax up the, uh, the view graphs that had been made for ACE, the Advanced Composition Explorer, which actually was launched in 1997, that APL was going to build. And, and presented, and this is actually a page from the facts that was sent up to New Hampshire, in the presentation of view graphs that he made uh, about this. And, he, and, and uh, I just want to read from an oral history because it tells the story much better than I would ever tell it. He said, it had all the ingredients, this is his Tom Cremage, all the ingredients of planetary spacecraft, it had a rocket engine, it had the instruments, it had the orientation, it had the solar panels. Then at the end, Joe Viverka was chairing the session and said, all right, Cremage, how much does that cost? I said, you guys seem to be experts in cost. You tell me, what do you think this mission should cost? He said, $400 million. I said, you're in the right ballpark for the spacecraft, except you have one zero too many. He said, what are you talking about? I said, the spacecraft is actually $45 million, and the instrument's another $30 million. So at least in his telling of the story, this is the origin story of discovery from Tom Kermigis' perspective, that he, that Coming out of that workshop, they decided, indeed, well, at least we should study that. Study the concept of a small uh, spacecraft mission, maybe uh, based on an Explorer model. And I think it's interesting that Tom Kermigis is a participant in both the planetary sciences community and the space physics, are now called, most likely called heliophysics communities, and he had this dual disciplinary perspective which allowed him to look across a lines that the planetary scientists didn't think, didn't, hadn't known much about Explorer, he said, to his great surprise. So in, in uh, fiscal year 1990, Jeff Briggs started the discovery program, created a discovery science program, a science working group, uh, uh, named Bob Farquhar, who was at Goddard, to be the program chief, program head, at least part-time, of this little program. The science working group held two meetings, and yet, somehow, the near concept, which had emerged from the New Hampshire workshop as the pro probable next mission and a way to go, didn't really go anywhere. And I'm actually, it's a long story, and I don't, I'm, and I'm going to take up way too much time here to talk about it. But it did, does seem to have languished during the year 1989-1990. One theory that I have is that a lack of a sense of urgency from the top, from Len Fisk and others at the time, Things seemed to be going well. There was lots of money. Was this urgent? Maybe not. Another question is whether the creation of Bush's uh, Space Exploration Initiative, which caused the replanning process in the planetary program to consider what we're going to do to support a human mission to Mars, might have resulted in a distraction. But at any rate, not much of anything happened during that fiscal year, and NEAR was not funded as uh, Tom Cremegis had expected. Uh, now, of course, we have Wes Huntress who's sitting here. So it's an interesting experience. I'm used to writing about, about dead people or not, Nazis that won't talk to me. <laughs> so it's, very, it's a little intimidating to sit here and talk to the participants. And, uh, but anyway, um, uh, Wes Huntress became uh, chief of SSED in August 1990. Uh, replacing Briggs and uh, uh, discovery, as he said in a set of three oral histories that I have with him and in, a in a phone conversation we had, discovery was one of his three major objectives. Interestingly enough, one of them was extrasolar planets. He initiated an extrasolar planetary program out of the planetary or solar system exploration division. 
And he decided that in order to revive this initiative, which seemed to be lang languishing, he revised the, uh, the science working group, put Joe Viverka in command of that, or in the leadership of that. He created a technical committee, uh, Jim Martin of Langley, a, a legendary manager of Viking, as the head of a technical community, and hoped, said, go out and try to you know, get this thing going and, and go somewhere. Uh, at this point in time, at least by uh, uh, Wes Huntress's account, he basically was looking at the options. Who could be a competitor to JPL? And this is a story that is, uh, uh, unfortunately, all our JPL friends in the room is not entirely flattering to JPL because the perception that he had and several other people and Tom Kermigis had was the place was very wedded to giant expensive projects, could not adapt to a small low cost mission, uh, was uh, very resistant to any other organization having any piece of its turf, was very afraid that some other organization would come and steal its charter. And so was very resistant and he and, 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 and Huntress looked around and uh, what are the options? NRL was an option but they didn't seem terribly interested. Uh, 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 sorry, our friends at Ames, uh, but he, uh, he's told me and, or told several oral history interviews he didn't have much confidence in Ames anymore and ability to do an interplanetary mission. And that left APL as one of the most, like, the, the most likely candidates for a com competition, to a, a competition whose project was maybe not only to get discovery started and to do a good near-Earth asteroid mission, but also to give JPL a shaking up. and. Uh, a motivation to do better on small programs. So this led to the funding of the NEAR project in fiscal 1991 uh, uh, and a showdown that happened in Pasadena in, in uh, May 1991, uh, APL versus JPL NEAR. This is an early NEAR sketch, NEAR proposal idea. Um, the outcome of that was rather uh, uh, a legend at APL and forgotten at JPL because basically JPL's proposal was a disaster and uh, uh, was proposed for a $450 million program that would monopolize discovery for a decade uh, and take three missions just to get to the asteroid. And APL proposed a $110, mission, $110 million mission. And so Huntress decided to pick APL Although it's interesting, I really, I'm talking too long, I'm running out of time to, to, to t tell the rest of this story, but uh, he, he decided in part because it, the superior proposal was APL, at, even after JPL got a second chance, but it was also because he was looking for a way to stimulate JPL to think about doing something new and to try it a different way. And he has specifically picked out Tony Spear, who had been project manager on Magellan, has saved Magellan to be, uh, run a small project office. Uh, at the time, the, this near mission seemed like it should go to APL. He picked APL, so he decided to create a lunar mission called Lunar Scout. But unfortunately, shortly after Lunar Scout's creation, it was stolen away by Mike Griffin, who had just been appointed the head of a new codex for exploration to try to revive the Bush Space Exploration Initiative. And so OSSA lost the moon for a little while, while codex existed, uh, which as he said, and I quote, that really pissed me off. So uh, <laughs> there's an oral history, there's an uncensored oral history. I like that. Um, so. Uh, he decided we got to find a Mars mission for JPL, a, some way, and of course they're already, you know, there's a lot of other things going on, which Eric Conway is, 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 has a history in, in the works about that. And so out of this came the Pathfinder proposal. Uh, and there was an AIM study for a so-called Measure uh, Mars Environmental Survey mission, and there'd be a Pathfinder mission to a network and all of that, and let me summarize more quickly here, uh, a mi micro rover was added. And at the end of this process, which sort of happened during the uh, winter of 91, 92, uh, the decision was, his decision was to incorporate the Pathfinder into discovery. Uh, the, it was, uh, the, hunt, the, the basic, measure for uh, discovery had been decided it would be a $150 million FY92 project 
this would have to come under the $150 million cap, but the rover was counted as a separate thing. It came from a different part of NASA, and it was, it, it was extra. And that was the decision then, that his decision was to make Pathfinder first and to push near into the background. To push near to, not in the background, but push near to second. To push it off the, out, out of being the first in line, which did not make Tom Kermijas happy at all. And so this would bump the near launch, which had been scheduled for 1997, into 1998. Uh, uh, this is, of course, now we're talking about 1992. But the funding for discovery could not happen until the next fiscal year, so it would not come up for budget consideration until the spring of 1993. And so essentially there was a year where uh, APL, which was uh, ticked off by this sudden demotion to second in the in discovery program, uh, didn't come about into a political consideration. Uh, however, uh, Tom Cremey just told Bob Farquhar, he should go look for other options. And they found another option. They found a launch to Eros in early 1996. Uh, this would, in fact, greatly accelerate the program, result in APL having to produce a spacecraft in only two years. Uh, Pathfinder was still first in the budget consideration when it came up in 1993, and, uh, and NEAR was at best minimally funded in that year, but Tom Kermijas was not about to take that lying down, basically. And the reason that he was able to do anything at all was because he had a long history of close association with Senator Barbara Mikulski in using the political system to lobby for APL's projects. And he intervened directly with the office of Senator Mikulski, who then uh, changed the whole dynamic. The budget consideration of FY93 would have funded Pathfinder, basically, and near on a very small budget for a 1998 launch. Instead, by using the political system, Tom Kermijus was able to get Mikulski to insert into the bill the full funding for near on an on a accelerated launch schedule to reach Eros by launching in February 1996. And as a result of that very uh, sort of abbreviated version of that history, the discovery program started in the fall of 1993 as a much better funded program with two full new start missions than it would otherwise have been. And one of the questions we have to ask is whether it might have resulted, if it had not been funded that way, would it have become a one mission program for Pathfinder? Wes Hunter says, well, at least uh, Golden was really only interested in Pathfinder and didn't know much about NEAR. At the very least, Discovery became a viable program at a higher funded level early on. And so I would say my, my fundamental interpretation that I've offered in this paper is, although Jeff Briggs had a role in starting the project, that the two key actors which made it happen were Wes Huntress and Tom Kermijus. And without them, Discovery might not have emerged at all. Uh, and certainly uh, led it to become the successful and transformative project for plantar exploration that it has become. Thank you very much. Uh oh. Speaking of participants talking to my paper. Uh, <laughs> is this thing dangerous? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, just a, just a comment uh, yeah. on your last slide there. Uh, uh, Dan Golden and I were not unaware of what the final outcome might be. We mm -hmm. were actually happy to see it happen that way. Which final outcome are you mean? You mean that we would get a new start for two, not just yeah. one. Yeah, but in one of your oral histories, you say that you you that he was really angry because of Mokalski's intervention. He was. Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, I know, you weren't. Yeah. I mean, I, I should add as an, an appendix to that, I have not mentioned Golden in this talk for the very simple reason that he actually doesn't deserve much credit or blame or anything else for this. This is a project that became the, the keystone of Faster, Better, Cheaper was launched without him, and his basic uh, contribution was to stay out of the way. Now, maybe in later years you could argue, you know, it would not have necessarily continued without the continual support of, a, of an administrator who wanted to keep it going. So. 
that's probably a contribution. This is really more of a comment than a question. Mm -hmm. that, that was a lot of fantastic background that I have wanted to have for years. <laughs> and I'm coming at this from a, the perspective of somebody who's been involved with discovery almost since its inception, but not that far back. Mm -hmm. In 1996, I was asked by Charles Alachi, who was, who was an assistant director of the lab, to head JPL's discovery program. And I knew about APL. I knew what a formidable technical powerhouse they were. I'd heard about Tom Kermegis, and I knew about Barbara Mikulski's special relationship with him. And so we took that competition extremely seriously. In fact, I think Alachi asked me to do that mm -hmm. job because I was the PI on, a, on an Earth science mission about the size of an explorer. But I'll tell you this, at the lab, my friend said, Greg, why are you doing this? This is a dead end. You know, it's the flagship missions that count. This, this discovery thing is never going to last. That was the attitude there for quite a, for quite a while. And now I can tell you uh, that, uh, that today I just passed the reins to someone else after Insight was selected. It's a core part of what we do at the lab. And not only that, but it has also had a very profound impact on how we do strategic mission planning in terms of the way we formulate them. We have uh, fallback options. We have more robust reserves. We have baseline payloads. We have the threshold payloads. And we also have a review process uh, over the strategic missions now that we never had before. And I think it's really mm -hmm. going to help us uh, keep them on track in the future. So I think the ramifications of discovery are far, uh, far beyond what we might even think today. Yeah, so certainly thank had you, this West, planning and, and dimension talk. that's a bit important in terms of PI-led missions. Thank you. Final paper uh, this afternoon is from Peter Markovsky from University of Oklahoma on a subject near and dear to my heart on the International Solar Polar Mission. Um, I just wanted to make a quick note. Um, on the program agenda, um, I originally wanted to talk about Ulysses and Giotto, um, but my paper and my project sort of evolved to only just talk about Ulysses. Um, I think in the kind of grander scheme of things, I'm going to fold Giotto in there. But for today, I'm only going to focus on the history of Ulysses. In May 1987, former ESA director Reimar Lust, upon reflection on American and European cooperation in space, emphasized, quote, the importance of a free and open exchange of views between the scientific communities of the United States and of Europe, end quote. He further stated that, it is true, and we should never deny the fact that we live in a world of conflicting or at least divergent political and economic interests. But in spite of that, I do believe that many of our present problems can be solved more easily when there is an international community of scientists and scholars free to follow common goals and common objectives. His reflective statements are perhaps in light of the tumultuous period of cooperation earlier in the decade, involving the collapse of the original agreement of the, on the International Solar Polar Mission, ISPM, in 1981. This mission would, would reemerge as Ulysses later in the decade, and by the time of its launch in 1990, it would cap an almost three-decade journey from its original conception as an out of ecliptic, or OEE probe, in the early 1960s. Today, I hope to show you that how, I hope to show you how the history of Ulysses, the Ulysses mission, can be reframed within a new emerging historical literature, which attempts to marry the history of space within a transnational framework to perhaps tell a more globalized narrative of space exploration. My work is an attempt to build upon what historian Asif Siddiqui proclaims as the issue of multiple and contradictory narratives engendered by national claims which have, which have been a staple of space history. While these nationalistic and even Cold War contexts have, have certainly had a tremendous influence upon the American and Soviet programs, what about, those po pro what about those ones which matured in the post-Cold War era, such as the Chinese, Japanese, or Indian programs? Or programs like ESA, which emerge in the same period uh, amidst larger concerns of European political integration? In the following talk, I will detail the 25-year history of Ulysses from its origins as a proposed OOE mission to its launch in 1990. In doing so, I will attempt to reframe the history uh, of Ulysses in transnational perspective and show two things. First, I will demonstrate that the spacecraft itself can be seen as a transnational object. That is, it's a, for, uh, it's a transnational form of cooperation is embedded in, this, in the technology itself, 
which was negotiated and shaped by the multitude of American and European historical actors over its 25-year history. Second, and more importantly, in detailing this history from the perspective of a number of historical actors, I will show that the emergence I will show the emergence of the varied meanings and imaginings of cooperation amidst the larger development of the joint mission. Um, all right. So shortly after the launch of Sputnik in 1957, space scientists began to discuss the advantages of utilizing spacecraft for a number of scientific investigations. Almost immediately, scientists on both sides of the Atlantic began to pursue solar observatory capabilities. These scientists began to coalesce and develop new and interesting strategies for solar exploration, one of which was an out of ecliptic mission. By the early to mid-1960s, a number of developments from both European and American scientists and engineers occurred. In Europe, two champions emerged. German astrophysicist Ludwig Biermann of the Max Planck Institute and British space scientist Harry Elliott of Imperial College. Biermann's contribution included the first publication to consider the scientific value of an OOE mission. The second champion, Elliot, was one of Britain's leading authorities in space science in this period. As an appointed chair of the British National Committee on Space Re Research's Working Group 3, he, he, was, he successfully steered his committee to the conclusion that an out of ecliptic mission would best meet the dual necessities of yielding novel scientific results and stimulating the nation's aerospace industry. From 1968 to 1971, he had mixed success regarding support and interest for an out of ecliptic mission, but ultimately his efforts resulted in the April 1982 European Space Research Organization, or ESROS, mission definition study. By the early 1970s, there were parallel, de excuse me, there were parallel developments amongst NAS NASA and U American space scientists regarding the feasibility of such a mission. Um, as it was also seen as a potential candidate for NASA's emerging planetary exploration program. By this time, American scientists and engineers were already developing solutions for issues that, might, that a possible OOE mission might face, and by extension, technical issues facing future interplanetary probes. While not as complete as the ESRO study, in July 1971, the Ames Research Center published the Pioneer H Jupiter Swing By Out of Ecliptic Mission Study. While the, while the report outlined a number of different launch and hardware configurations, the proposed Pioneer OOE would use the spare Pioneer spacecraft for Pioneer's F and G, which would eventually become Pioneer's 10 and 11, respectively. For the next few years, attempts by a number of American scientists to persuade NASA administrators to use the backup Pioneer probe for an OOE mission went largely unsuccessful. While a number of administrators recognized the potential benefits, a few concerns arose regarding its use. Writing to John Nagel, Norman Ness, the chief of Laboratory for Extra Extraterrestrial Physics at Goddard, um, expressed concerns about the use of a backup pioneer. According to him, an OOE mission seems like an exceedingly worthwhile mission scientifically, and perhaps a backup pioneer probe might not fully capture the potential of an OOE mission. At his behest, he urged its adoption only if the payload be entirely reconsidered. In response, Nagel cited budgetary and time constraints regarding the solicitation of an entirely new spacecraft. About a year later, in August 1972, Homer Newell expressed another concern regarding the use of a backup Pioneer probe for an OOE mission. His suggestion was to keep the Pioneer was to keep the Pioneer H as a, was to keep Pioneer H as a backup in case Pioneer 10 would not provide sufficient data regarding um, issues like radiation environment of the interplanetary space. By mid-decade, NASA administrators would continue to solicit advice regarding an OOE mission. But as, as we have seen in yesterday's talks, which highlighted budgetary concerns in this period, NASA, as a result, became increasingly supportive of a joint international mission. American scientists' reactions to such a joint mission were varied. By summer of 1974, some expressed concern uh, about the perceived lack of consultation within the scientific community. John Simpson, physicist at the Enrico Fermi Institute, wrote to James Fletcher in 1974 expressing the importance of an OOE mission. He stated, I was shocked to learn when I was in Italy that NASA had invited the European Space Group to consider taking over this type of mission. I find this incredible since I can think of no other mission which would guarantee as many scientific discoveries per dollar spent on a major mission than this one. 
Thus, this potential reduction of participation by U.S. scientists is hard to justify within the United States, both for strengthening U.S. science at this time and for NASA's stated objective of supporting U.S. science. This mission is outstanding. I am just strongly enough oriented towards strengthening U.S. science uh, at this time to argue that this should be an all-U.S. mission, if possible. Nagel recognized by mid-decade that while U.S. scientists were increasingly concerned about the idea of international cooperation, Congress, on the other hand, was becoming more interested in the idea of cooperation in space missions in general. According to him, Congress views such cooperation as a reduction in funding requirements, whereas the U.S. scientists regard such missions which will carry U.S. and foreign experiments as a reduction in their own opportunities to do research. In the tight budget climate for space science, two different concerns from two different groups seem to place their opinions at odds. To Nagel, and perhaps to other NASA administrators, cooperation would actually be a good compromise for all parties involved, as collaboration would produce a net increase in the number of flights, and hence a net increase in the total opportunities for U.S. scientists. Moving on. By the end of 1974, two main developments led to what would eventually become ISPM. In Europe, as Ezra was considering mission priorities for the 1980s, a stereoscopic mission to study coronal phenomena emerged as a compelling and worthwhile candidate for a future mission. Ezra's Launching Program Advisory Committee, LPAC, included both an OE OOE and a stereoscopic mission as top priorities, which led to the second development, the combination of a stereoscopic mission and then OOE one. And this essentially proposed that um, the out of ecliptic mission would use two, you would launch two satellites, one which would fly over the North Pole of the Sun and another one which would fly over the South Pole. NASA seemed to agree, and according to James Fletcher, the best chance of implementing an out of ecliptic mission is with a mission mode that will attract as wide a constituency as possible, something that co a combined stereoscopic and OEE mission would do. These, de these developments created a ripe atmosphere for cooperation. In 1974, Ezra and NASA agreed to cooperate on two joint missions um, at, the, at the joint science program review held at Aztec, and one of the uh, agreed programs was the combined stereoscopic OOE mission. Combining two such missions was very favorable to both NASA and Ezra administrators, and as a result, um, a, a science working group was established in order to form an optimum mission mode. In the first few months of 1975, Based on the uh, joint study, Ezra and science planners recommended that an OOE dual stereoscopic spacecraft using a Jupiter gravitational assist as the most suitable candidate for cooperation. As historian Carl Huffbauer has shown, ESA, which replaced Ezra as Europe's prime space organization in 1975, emphasized a number of priorities for the cooperative OOE mission, such as clean interfaces, their involvement in the choice of experiments, and principal investigators, um, observations of Jupiter, their insistence on observations of Jupiter be made during the swing by, and the conviction that the two spacecraft option remain essential. Overall, by mid-decade, the mission constituency for an OOE mission became broader, larger, and more diverse. In April 1977, NASA and ESA began soliciting propo proposals for an OOE, and by March 1978, a total of 16 experiments were chosen for more than 200 scientists belonging to 65 universities from Europe and the United States. While the specific technical and scientific capabilities of the, OO the OOE mission were developed from 77 to 78, securing funding for the cooperative mission was increasingly becoming a problem. For instance, in May 1977, NASA was scheduled to take a $77 million cut to the fiscal year 78 budget. This had a particular impact on the planetary missions program, especially for the newly planned Jupiter orbiter probe. In July, the House of Representatives approved $17.7 million for the Jupiter probe, and as a stipu although um, they had a stipulation, uh, and that was that the uh, upcoming plan start, for, uh, 1979 plan start for OE would use a modified version of the Jupiter orbiter probe. So thus, um, the fates both of OE and the Jupiter orbiter were connected. With this new budget approval for the for the orbiter, the OE mission plans would have been. Without the new budget approval, the OOE would have been threatened. Requesting more funding for the out of ecliptic mission, which by late 1977 was renamed as the Solar Polar Mission, was becoming increasingly difficult. In September 1977, NASA secured authorization from the uh, OMB, 
from ONB for an initial fiscal 78 budget of $13 million, arguing that it was their only new start for that year. Despite these issues, one year later in 1978, after intense lobbying efforts of the American space science community and Harold Glasser, the first director of, NASA, of the NASA Solar Terrestrial Division, Jimmy Carter officially approved the Solar Polar Mission. Six months later, on March 29, 1979, NASA and ESA signed the Memorandum of Understanding for the International Solar Polar Mission. As was seen prior to the signing of the MOU, ISPM was already facing budget issues. In January 1978, NASA submitted a budget request for fiscal year 79, um, which included $13 million for ISPM, um, claiming it was one of their five New START programs for that year. Although Congress approved it, they cut $5 million of that budget in order to reallocate those funds to cover cost overruns for the space shuttle development. By the end of the year, the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee wrote to NASA Administrator Robert Frosch suggesting that ISPM be laid two years, citing two reasons, to reflect the delays in shuttle development and because the committee was concerned with the inertial upper stage necessary to send the two spacecraft on the flight path would not be adequate and that NASA should develop a high energy upper stage instead. Despite $135 million worth of contracts already promised by this point, ISPM was teetering on the edge of cancellation as the Carter, uh, as the Carter administration submitted an amended budget in fiscal year 1981, which called for a two-year launch delay and roughly $43 million cut. The cut and delay urged protests by a number of groups, which included not only European nations, but also the White House and State Department. White House officials, in a letter to uh, Massachusetts Representative Edward Bowen, claimed that the action threatens not only international cooperation in space, but other areas of technology as well. A few months later, the House Appropriations Committee recommended in the 1980 Supplemental Appropriations Bill that ISPM be canceled, citing among other reasons that the two-year delay would cost at least an additional $150 million. While ESA reacted to the possible cancellation with strong diplomatic protest, Florida Representative Don Fuqua successfully argued that the cancellation of the funds would constitute legislation and appropriations bill, a violation of House rules. As Joan Johnson Fries has shown, the fate of ISPM took a turn for the worse in the early 1980s, as the whole budget process and attitude fundamentally changed with the election of uh, President Ronald Reagan and his appointment of David Stockton as director of OMB. By early 1981, it became clear that the Reagan administration's proposed budget cuts for NASA would effectively cancel ISPM. After Reagan took office, OMB amended the fiscal year 82 space science budget by almost 23%. This move effectively signaled the, can the cancellation of the development of the American portion of ISPM. The swift and almost unilateral decision by the Reagan administration elicited uproar from both American and European delegations. American politicians decried that that, the, that a lack of new START projects could jeopardize the ability for NASA to keep its status as a scientific and engineering leader. ESA individuals responded by declaring the decision to be an unacceptable breach of the Memorandum of Understanding. As a response, NASA and the, and the Reagan administration offered vague reassurances that the U.S. would remain as part of the ISPM mission at a reduced capacity, which Europe viewed as unacceptable as well. By March of that year, ESA assembled its political forces against this decision. Director General of ESA at the time, Eric Quisgard, stated to the House Science and Technology Committee that it cannot be accepted that at such an advanced stage of ISPM development, and after a commitment of more than half of the European funding, NASA presents ESA with the fait accompli of its withdrawal from an international cooperative program, especially without prior consultation. He further went, went on to tell the committee that the short-term financial advantage for NASA might come at the cost of potential future cooperative ventures. In the following weeks, Quisgard and, at, and ESA expressed willingness for a compromise solution, as long as the U.S. was willing to reinstate its spacecraft. Despite some promising efforts in the early summer of 1981, newly instated NASA Administrator James Beggs informed Quisgard on September 9th, quote, that NASA would not include any request for funds for the second ISPM spacecraft in the fiscal year 83 budget. He did offer support and encouragement for ESA to pursue a single spacecraft mission in which NASA would fulfill any remaining commitments. By the end of the year, the dual spacecraft ISPM mission was officially out of commission. Despite the cancellation of the U.S. craft, 
ESA decided to continue with the solar polar probe, citing a, a substantial commitment already made thus far. In the early 1982, ESA sought continued assurance from NASA and Congress. They also made a point to stress in their discussions um, to develop uh, and establish a framework for future cooperative ventures. The start of what Johnson Fries characterizes as a strategy that as a strategy that ultimately made ESA a stronger, autonomous, and more independent space agency. Moreover, in July 1984, ESA announced the renaming of ISPM to Ulysses. While they suggested the name change was, cho was chosen to reflect the hero in the Odyssey and a reference to Dante's Inferno, perhaps this name change also reflects the long, arduous journey of development. While it was scheduled, um, while the uh, Ulysses was originally scheduled to be launched in, 1980, in May 1986 aboard the space shuttle, um, the, the Challenger, uh, the Challenger ac accident delayed further uh, launch uh, indefinitely. A new launch date was eventually chosen uh, after the restoration of the shuttle program, and Ulysses was finally launched as part of STS-41 on October 6, 1990. So what makes the history of Ulysses transnational? To start, I would like to suggest that the main technological component, the spacecraft itself, is an example of a transnational object. By this, I mean that the mission and the spacecraft was negotiated along transnational lines, in which a host of actors and institutions helped to shape the technological component itself. That is, its development into what it eventually became was a result of a number of different factors and lines of cooperation from both European and American space agencies. Finally, I would like to conclude with another aspect of Ulysses' history that benefits from this perspective. The approach that I have taken highlights the changing meanings and imaginings of cooperation and collaboration between the various actors and organizations, such as the number of individuals at NASA and ESA, as well as the number of scientific and engineering communities. It seems at different times, different individuals saw different sets of values, or perhaps no value at all, in cooperation on an out of ecliptic mission. Furthermore, Ulysses provides an interesting case study uh, for such an analysis as it complicates the nature of cooperation in the sense that it was a failed project, as its original conception as a dual spacecraft mission dissolved. Yet, while the original vision of, cooper the original vision of a cooperative ISPM mission failed, the project lived on, both in the sense that it, uh, an actual material object was created, Ulysses, and the Ulysses probe, um, and the Ulysses mission continued, albeit in a different form. In this light, I would like to ask the question, what exactly is a failure? While the ISPM mission was never launched, some form of an OAE mission did eventually make its journey around Jupiter and towards the Sun. While I do not think I can provide a concrete historical answer as of yet, I think in reframing Ulysses in this way, um, hopefully I can tease out some of the more interesting and nuanced aspects involved in failure more generally uh, in space exploration and cooperative ventures in space exploration. So to conclude, hopefully I've demonstrated why and how adopting uh, a transnational perspective might enrich our understanding of, interna of international cooperation and space exploration more generally. While I've only scratched the surface in this paper, I believe that ultimately adopting this perspective might help us understand the multiple imagined and varying meanings of collaboration constructed by both NASA and ESO. Thank you. Encouragement. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see over here. Sure, go ahead. No worries. 
Thank you. Yeah, this is for the last speaker. Thank you for it was a fantastic presentation. I wanted to ask a little bit or push a little more, allow you to expand a bit on the notion of a transnational object, uh, particularly as distinct from, say, a boundary object. And especially in the light of uh, current trends in uh, transnational theory and anthropology, for example, that would inspire us to step away from any idea that nation states are necessarily the boundaries by means of which um, national or transnational collaboration should be understood. And how that's particularly tricky in the case of space missions when you have these large institutions institutions that are bound up in national frameworks, but also especially that, that represent national interests. And I'm wondering how looking at, say, the Ulysses uh, as a transnational object inspires us to break apart perhaps our notions of the singular, um, for example, European Space Agency, et cetera. Yeah, so in the, in the longer story, I didn't outline it in the paper, I mean in my talk, but in the paper, um, there are a lot more discussions, particularly about the specific components. Uh, one such thing was the uh, kind of the engine component. Um, uh, and RTG was eventually used for, for Ulysses. Um, but I, I think that in focusing on these discussions, which, which uh, were within the specific communities themselves, mm -hmm. so they weren't necessarily discussions uh, amongst administrator to administrator, but these were d the different scientific communities arguing, well, you know, this configuration is better, or this configuration is, is worse, or something along those lines. Um, I think uh, of sort of prioritizing the, the sort of top-down view less and kind of teasing out these, these smaller kind of arrangements and arguments uh, and discussions, it, doesn't, it won't necessarily completely push out the national context, but it won't prioritize it as a kind of major focus. Right. Thank you. Yeah, did the uh, clamps of the Green Bank Telescope create concerns at parks? Uh, the, the, the radio telescope at Green Bank had the rather spectacular collapse a few years ago. From oh, 1998. Yes. That, that one. Uh, ah, yeah. Well, that was actually, that's a good point because the, the Green Bank, I think it was the 120 foot telescope that collapsed, um, was, uh, was put together very rapidly um, for a very, designed to be used only for a, a, a very short period. And then, um, but it was continually extended, of course, and it was a transit instrument. and. Um, um, it failed from metal fatigue and so on. Um, but the Parkes telescope was designed to have a lifetime of about 20 or so years. And last year we celebrated the 50th anniversary and with the new upgrades we're doing, we're, we're going to probably continue for, for many more years to, to come. Um, but no, I think um, a lot of the, the users of the Parkes telescope were users of, of, of um, the instruments at Green Bank, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in West Virginia. and um, there were always a lot of close ties between the, the two um, radio astronomy communities and um, uh, I think at the time it came as a profound surprise. Um, I know it came as a surprise to the observer at the time. Um, it just, <laughs> he just was not expecting that. I hope it never happens to Parks because the control room is directly under the dish. And so, <laughs> um, so um, but yeah, the, you know, the, um, but the replacement of it, the green, the, the 110 foot um, Green Bank telescope is a magnificent instrument, you know. Um, and I certainly hope that um, it's able to, to continue. I understand that it's, it's under some threat because of the um, reassessment of its funding and so on. Um, but it, it really is a magnificent instrument, the replacement for the one that collapsed. And, um, um, and uh, as I said, I hope it, it does continue. Yeah. yeah, Torrance Johnson. Uh, this is just a further comment for Peter's excellent study on the U U Ulysses. Um, uh, international issues. Uh, and it's, what I find interesting is despite the natural angst which you have described between the communities involved, because uh, uh, everybody felt, uh, if not betrayed, at least uh, not dealt with fairly by each other's governments and so forth. Uh, within a few years, we were actually cooperating, as you point out, uh, on, on a number of things. Interestingly enough, one of the most important cooperations was on the return to flight launch schedules, because uh, as they got the shuttle going again, both Galileo and Ulysses wanted to launch in the same opportunity. They're going to the same place, Jupiter. So the, so the windows were the same. 
And as, as it turned out, it fell to Peter Wenzel, who is the uh, project scientist uh, for Ulysses and myself, to work with our individual project science groups to try to develop the arguments as to who should go first. Because Admiral truly said, I can't want you both in the same month. That puts too much risk on getting you guys back into space. And we did that very amicably with both of our PSGs having people both from Europe and the US on it and so forth. So that's another example of how that, uh, the uh, sort of the, the uh, international uh, gestalt, if you will, that was, was developed on, on this in spite of the stresses uh, uh, ended up coming up with an amicable solution. The interesting thing, aspects about the story is despite all of these sort of conflicts involved, Things do happen. Things did happen. And seemingly, um, you know, uh, in the early 80s, ESA kind of really saw the, the cancellation of the U.S. Uh, spacecraft as, to them, it was a big deal. It was a kind of a breach of an agreement, almost as if they would breach any other treat, uh, political treaty. Um, but despite all of that, you know, things do still happen. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burke. I would uh, appreciate your um, insight as to the a role or the effect that the Apollo program had on Ranger. Uh, you've already indicated the uh, reduction to just the TV as the payload, uh, but um, uh, I would be very interested to know if there were uh, other uh, reasons for that related to Apollo especially. The Apollo program had some effect on Ranger, uh, primarily an indirect effect of uh, causing the community interested in Ranger, us at JPL and the scientists, uh, everybody involved, uh, really, really wanted some success. Uh, and that's why the uh, block of four Rangers, six, seven, eight, and nine, had the much simplified objective of not trying to land on the moon, stop and have a seismometer there, but just go on and crash with the television on the way in. Simplifying the objective, uh, just changing the payload, leaving the bus the same, you see, simplifying the objective by putting the RCA camera payload on instead of the more complicated objective of a retro rocket a radar trigger, a ball that has to survive, et cetera. All the things that Soviets did with <laughs> Luna 9, eventually in 1966, simplifying the objective in the attempt to get a success was the number one priority. The number two priority was to get some images that might be useful for Apollo. But Images can't really tell you what you really want to know. Is, is the thing going to sink in <laughs> or upset or whatever? So Ranger did move its objectives towards support of Apollo, but it couldn't really go very far. Taking pictures on the way in is all you can do. Uh, and yes, we got three beautiful successes with thousands and thousands of good images. Whether the Apollo designers paid any attention to those, uh, I don't know. Okay, thank you. So, in listening to all the talks, what, what strikes me is that perhaps things in the past aren't as different as they are today. It sounds like that in, in each case there were, there were technical issues going on that were running into political issues and political cycles that were running on time scales that were much shorter than, than the technical ones. And so I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, right now we're looking with the, with the planetary budget here in the U.S. has already precipitated uh, new issues with uh, cooperation with ESA, not terribly unlike what happened with Ulysses. And we've got... Um, We've either got an, a going out of business sale or we've got a bump in the road, uh, depending upon how things come out, sort of like what had happened with uh, perhaps with the Discovery Program. And I'm just wondering, you know, hopefully history is good because it helps to inform the future. And I'm just wondering if, if perhaps all of you might comment a little bit on, you know, 
what are the real lessons that we perhaps should have learned from all of this and and how can that those perhaps help to inform us of what perhaps we should be doing to uh, to keep going forward with all the, the physical issues today you know it's a, historians I guess we never really want to talk about predicting or influencing the future we're mostly interested in explaining the past but clearly we've you know seen in multiple papers throughout this conference that uh, the issue of budgetary cycles of political uh, political changes means that you have to very much put the current crisis in perspective and realize that that your problems aren't new at all and in, in most cases they're simply really almost nothing new it's more more of a cyclical nature um, that's not a very good answer to your <laughs> to your question because I, I lessons learned uh, it, uh, probably it's useful for the actors and the participants to just be conscious of of this this larger context in which they operate follow that in a little bit different direction but I think it's related they the difficulty on Ranger that caused me to be replaced by Bud Shermeyer, my good friend, uh, originated really not with the five consecutive failures uh, over which I presided, but rather with the attempt uh, by members of the scientific community to add space physics experiments, eight of them, on board rangers at a time when we were in big trouble already. And uh, my version of it is, look, we're trying to do something about the moon. Space physics is wonderful. Go do some experiments on a spacecraft that's more appropriately suited to that, one that stays out there and goes around and does things. And of course, nowadays, there are hundreds of them doing beautiful space physics in the magnetosphere and all the way out to the voyagers to the edge of the heliosphere. So space physics is being richly served now, but adding them to the rangers at the time when we were already in terrific trouble was something I just didn't want to do. And remember, I still thought the project manager had a lot more authority than I really did have, so I pushed back at NASA very hard. Uh, that might have been a strong contributor to the capsize of the project and the replacement of the project manager. Uh, argument between those communities, interestingly enough, yeah. in <laughs> Mr. Neufeld's paper, that exact same dispute erupted again during the discussion of NEAR and the other missions uh, between the space physics community and the planetary geology, et cetera. At that stage, it wasn't so much test or uh, anymore it was more about differing communities operating in differing worlds and not actually communicating it's in, uh, I mean you know Kermija uh, says uh, I was amazed that the uh, planetary scientists didn't know anything about Explorer uh, as you know uh, a famous name in in the history of, of uh, Earth satellite uh, a wonderful development satellite. General, yeah, I hate to interrupt but we have two more questions so that if we can get them in very quickly with a quick response well, I'm following up on Ralph's question, which you you commented that uh, you know that we've been through these ebbs and flows before, and there's nothing new under the sun in a, in a sense. Uh, however, when I've talked with some of the folks from the early days, when uh, when things really looked dire, and this was back in the early '80s, and I mean people like Lou Friedman. I don't know if Lou's still here right now. I've said, well, how do things compare today on the planetary, the risks of the planetary program future uh, compared with that? And he said he thinks that it's much worse, that it's a much more dire situation potentially. So as a historian, can you m help us mine from the lessons of the past? What are maybe some of the key things that we ought to be doing today in order to make sure that we don't suffer the fate that we could be suffering? Asked me to help you do the future, <laughs> and, and I don't feel no, at all. But I'm asking you to, to look into the past to see what things worked in the past, and just share yeah, those. Uh, what were the things that really helped turn things around? In I the mean, past? actually, John Lawson would be the better person to talk about the, the the survival crisis of the early '80s than I would. But you know, clearly, having a program of missions, uh, discovery is a good model in many ways for having a line and a program, a consistent direction. 
uh, it's harder to sustain something like that with the, the huge flagship programs. You can only afford a multi-billion dollar program every once in a while, so it's much harder to keep a sustained project like that. Obviously, there has to be considerable attention to, to uh, convincing the political establishment that there's still important new information to come out of this, but often it boils down to, as in the case of Tom Kermegis, I'm sure that Barbara Mikulski believed the science coming out of APL and Goddard and Space Telescope Science Institute, the Maryland institutions, were great, but her first concern was, you know, high-paying jobs in Maryland, keep them, keep them there. And so, obviously, often this boils down to going back to politicians and arguing for sustaining institutions that are contributing a lot to the economy, and science is a, a nice byproduct of that, of that fact. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to commit one of the things I don't, the sin that I don't uh, condone, which is I'm going to comment more than question. But, um, you know, I'm going to dispute what, what Greg said and, and also somewhat the premise of, of Ralph, uh, Ralph McNutt there. And I think there is a fundamental difference today than the past. You know, there's a number of sayings about, um, you know, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And then there's the saying that, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. You know, but I think there is a certain, you know, we have learned things. There are things that are different today than, than back uh, in, in the period that a number of these people were talking about. You know, we have a decadal survey now. We did not have that that process, and I, I'm a big believer in that process. Having seen it work, I think it has credibility. I think it has credi external credibility um, to important political constituencies. And then we have program lines like Discovery, like New Frontiers. Uh, I think that one of the, the, the big differences, another big difference that we have is you are less likely to see today the the big gaps in exploration programs that we saw in the past. I mean, how long do we go between Mars missions? How long do we go between lunar missions? And now those things are much more uh, uh, included in uh, discovery. They're included in other program lines. And, and it seems like, uh, you know, uh, I, I know you guys rely on your day-to-day -day existence upon, uh, you know, new programs coming along. But, but I think that there's, you know, uh, I do see a certain progressive um, trend in, you know, what has happened that we've learned from some of these, uh, these errors. And it doesn't mean we're not going to commit the mistake again, but. Thank you very much. Oh, please it. join me in thanking the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My last line is that perhaps our troubles were a necessary step in the evolution toward the harmony that we have today. <laughs> and that, that sounds like a good way to go take a break. All right. Uh, thank you all so very much to Joan for running a uh, well-timed panel because we're on time as we go into our break. Remember, we'll be back here at 3.15 for our last panel, which will be a great one, too, I'm sure. Thank you, Joan.